The current understanding, I think, of the First World War, although it has changed over time, is it was just a complete mistake, a complete waste, there was no purpose to it, and the image we have is of the trenches on the Western Front, of the horror of those trenches, and if we know anything about it, it's because we've read some of the great war memoirs uh, that came out which give a very bleak picture of the war. What historians have been doing is challenging some of the myths about the First World War. That, for example, it was about nothing at all. And I think if you look back, people at the time, and I think we must respect their feelings and their ideas even if we don't agree with them, people at the time thought the war was about something. Pretty much in every country, people thought they were defending something. They were defending their way of life, they were defending their families, they were defending their homeland. And I think they often felt that they were fighting an enemy which had very different values. And so the British felt, I think, very strongly that they were fighting a Germany which was militaristic and authoritarian, and they were fighting for a very important cause. You know, one of the other myths about the First World War, which people still repeat, is that when the war broke out, everyone cheered, shouted, threw flowers around, it was all going to be this wonderful thing. And we now know, and historians have shown, this is not true. They've looked at what people were actually saying, they've looked at diaries, they've looked at letters, they've looked at what the press was saying. And so the picture that has emerged is much more nuanced. If you think of, um, for example, the role of women in, 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 in the First World War, I, I mean, most historians today would say, uh, well, there isn't a massive increase in female employment in Britain during the First World War. What there is is a conversion of the sorts of employment in which women are engaged from domestic service, textile industry and so on into munitions production. The actual increase in aggregate numbers is, is, is comparatively small. Nor is it true to say that well, British women got the vote because of their commitment to wartime work. Um, those who were engaged in that sort of activity were still under 30 in 1918 and they were not enfranchised in 1918 if they were under 30. What can academics do to contribute to this centenary? Uh, well, they can uh, start to push uh, in directions which think about this war comparatively rather than nationally. I mean, that seems to me the big agenda. When the war ended, uh, Ludendorff, the, the first quartermaster general of the German army, in explaining his sudden desire to seek an armistice, uh, attributed it to the collapse of Bulgaria, um, an ally of, of Germany. Uh, and that was a direct consequence of an Anglo-French offensive on the Macedonian front from Salonika. Uh, and you know, most of the British public, probably most of the French public, have completely forgotten about that dimension in explaining the war's end. I do have a problem with the use of this word remembrance in relation to the First World War because none of us do remember it. Uh, so my word for this is not remembrance but discovery. We're already, in that sense, so distant from this war. Far from the First World War as people in 1914 were from the Napoleonic Wars. And I don't think there was as great an interest in the Napoleonic Wars, but that may have been because the means of creating that interest weren't quite as varied. I find that when I write now, I spend a lot more time at home and a lot less time sort of trudging through libraries, trudging through archives, which can be fun in itself, but there used to be an awful lot of dog work in the old days. And so much material is now available on the internet. And so many books, memoirs, very, things that are very hard to find have now been scanned in. And so I think technology is making it possible for us to access material quickly and easily in ways that we simply didn't have available before. We understand the war through our lens. You know, 2014 is the year British troops are coming back from Afghanistan. So there's a natural tendency to make connections between their lives in 1914 and our lives in 2014. And I don't think that's illegitimate. I just think we need to be aware of what we're doing. The history of the 20th century shows how very important it is to have international institutions, to have ways in which nations can talk to each other, how very important it is for nations to reassure those who, who, who might be their neighbours or who might be on a collision course with them, how very important it is to keep in contact and to reassure, how very important it is for the civilians to keep the military under control and to know what it is that the military are planning. I mean, one of the things that led to the catastrophe of the First World War is that in certain key countries, such as Russia and Germany, the civilians didn't really know what the military were up to, and by the time they found out it was too late to do anything about it. It is so difficult to explain both how it started, uh, why it continued for so long, and, and, and what its ending meant. We are living in other ways with the consequences of the collapse of three other empires, that is the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and um, the Russian Empire.
um, all of which came to an end in 1917-18. If you get very familiar with the period, and I suppose one of the periods I am familiar with is the period before 1914, you get a sense of the fabric of daily life and, and you know what comes out so clearly before 1914 is how many people were just getting on with life. You know they were making plans for the future, it was the summer when the crisis began to unfold and so people were going on summer holidays and very few of them thought that anything was going wrong. 